is nice to be able to uh, even begin to sing a bit, even if behind your masters, and stand up to sing as well. Uh, it's my theory that it's good for the circulation to stand up, to keep standing up and down, but whether that's true or not, I don't know. But our first hymn is 647, In Christ Alone My Hope Is Found. that turning away of you as he bore the wrath of God 
against our sin. And we thank you again because of that shed blood. We can be cleansed from our sins. We can be forgiven and we can have that gift of Christ's righteousness put to our account. Oh Father, we pray that you would help us this evening. Help us to draw near to you and to experience you drawing near to us in this service, in our hymns, our readings and every part of it, Lord. We thank you for, for Sam's ministry this morning. We thank you for what he sought to teach us. And we pray, pray Lord of God, for wherever your people meet tonight, that you will be real and present with them, speaking to them. Lord, we thank you that you are building your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Oh Lord, we do know that in many parts of the world your people suffer, suffer greatly um, from persecution from uh, extremists who try to exterminate your name, or suffering hardship, hunger, much kind of suffering and we pray Lord that we will not forget them that we will remember them Lord Lord we thank you for other works we thank you Lord for the work in Madeira which Jason Murphy is is doing there the church he is seeking to plant there and we pray that even the services that he has held there today he will have blessed that that, that ministry that your word gone out to those people there Lord God, we, we are reminded from the news of the many uh, sad things that happen in our world, many distressing things. We think of these natural disasters. We know it's part of the, of the creation groaning in, in pain until that day when you will return again. And yet we know that people suffer um, in that the earthquake in Haiti and the floods and the fires, these things, Lord. And even more locally, more in our own country, we see the awful things that happened in Plymouth over, over these past few days. And pray that in some way you will comfort those who, who have suffered the loss of a loved one. And Father, we do pray for Afghanistan too. We don't really know what to pray for, for that chaos and turmoil there. It seems that it's gone backwards, even, over, even despite the 20 years that have the Western forces have been there. We pray for any Christians in that land that you would help them and that you would prevent much blood being shed and much brutality. Lord, we see one face of the Taliban um, in the media, but we, we are conscious that there is another side to them as well. And Lord, we just pray you will. We know that you are sovereign and you are working out your purposes in all things. Father, we pray for those who are in our own fellowship in need. We thank you that Carol was making good progress with her arm and that she won't have to go back for another six weeks and pray that that will continue, Lord. We do pray for Margaret, Father, that you would uphold her and keep her eyes fixed upon you, Lord. May you comfort her and help her. And for others who we know within the fellowship, those who still mourn the loss of loved ones, that you would comfort them and encourage and help them, Lord. Others who are facing serious illness, perhaps in their families, Lord, that you'll be near to them too, dear Father. So continue with us now, gracious God. We pray in the name of Jesus and for his sake and glory. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read a few verses from Matthew chapter 7 to begin with before our next hymn. Um, we are going to, the main reading will be in, in the book of James. We did start a couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks on Sunday evening, to look at the epistle of James and also continue in the Bible studies. And all welcome to come on the Bible studies on Tuesdays if you can. And we'll be continuing to go through the book of James. And this, uh, this Tuesday, looking at James chapter 3, 1 to 12, I think it is. Taming the tongue. Ooh, not a, James has some challenging words to say 
about these things. Anyway, Matthew chapter 7, verses uh, 15 to 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Amen. Let's turn now to our, our next hymn, number 590. Good to be able to announce hymn numbers again, isn't it? 590. Not what these hands have done can save this guilty soul. Not what this toiling flesh has borne can make my spirit whole. chapter 2, and reading verses 14 to 26. It is on there on the screen if you want to follow it there. The chapter begins with these words, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, someone who professes faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory with partiality, or it can be translated, the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the glory, with partiality. And those first few verses deal with people having prejudices, having um, partiality or showing favouritism. But then we come to verses 14 to 26. Just 
century. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by, by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect and the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise was not Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And we'll come to that passage in a moment. We'll turn again to our hymn book, or rather this time it should be on the screen. Uh, this time if we sit down for, for it, it's hard to see the screen if some of us are standing, but it's uh, it is in the hymn book, Search Me, O God, and Know My Heart Today. I'll play the tune all through. Yes, please, yes, please play the tune through. <laughs> Revival comes from thee, 
Send a revival, start the work in me. Thy word declares, thou wilt supply our need. For blessing now, O Lord, I humbly plead. And I understand that the writer of that hymn was someone who knew, who wrote a lot about revivals, Edwin Orr. Let's come now to uh, our passage. The uh, ex-president of the USA, Jimmy Carter, I don't know if some of you are old enough to remember him, he was a peanut farmer, um, he once heard a sermon which went something like this, and it was quite a challenge to him. It, it says, if you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And this, I believe, is the heart of what the epistle of James is all about. If you claim to be a Christian, then does your life live up to what you profess? Is there enough evidence to convict you? In chapter 1, James refers to the, the importance of not only hearing God's word, but also being a doer of the word. In a way, he was echoing Jesus' parable of the sower. You may know the parable of the sower, that there are four soils described there. Four responses to the gospel. And it's only the fourth one which brought forth any fruit. Uh, the, the fourth type, the person who hears God's word, he goes into his heart, he believes it, and he does it, and it pr produces fr fruit. Some thirtyfold, some fiftyfold, some a hundredfold. So I want to look at this passage in James under... Well, two headings, or three headings, but the two headings are a claim to faith and authentic faith is never alone. But first, we've got to try and unravel a problem. The uh, 16th century reformer, Martin Luther, um, some of you may, a couple of years ago in 19, 2017, we remembered 500 years since his, since his life here in a sort of dramatization. But Martin Luther famously called the book of James an epistle of straw. I think he revised his view later on, but he did at one time. And, and, and at first he didn't think it should be included in the New Testament, in the Bible. Why, why did he think this? Well, I think we need to consider something of Luther's experience very briefly. He grew up in medieval Germany. He didn't have a Bible of his own in his own language. It was in Latin, the Bible. He, did, he only had a very basic understanding of uh, scripture teaching. He knew the Ten Commandments. He knew the uh, Apostles' Creed. Um, and the church of his day, it interpreted the Bible and put its own, uh, its own teaching above the Bible. So that's what the kind of uh, land kind of situation he grew up in. As a young man he had a dramatic experience in a thunderstorm and he vowed to become a monk and went into a monastery. He really wanted to live a righteous life. He wanted to please God. He was a sincere man but he, he had a problem and he knew that he didn't live up to those Ten Commandments inwardly and outwardly probably and he tried very hard to make himself righteous in God's sight. He went to great lengths. He was that kind of personality that, that was an extreme personality. He, uh, he, went, he did lots of fasting. He punished his body. Um, he went on a pilgrimage to Rome. But it was not until he became a Bible professor in a town called Wittenberg. And as he studied the book of Romans... Obviously he was going to teach that to students. That his eyes were opened. And he came to these verses in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. And he read, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power, the dynam dynamite of God, to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. 
And then Paul goes on in these words, For in it, that is in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And he understood now, at last, that he didn't have to make himself righteous by his efforts, but, but by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, believing in his death for our sins on the cross, that our sins are put to Christ's account and his perfect righteousness is credited to us, is given to us. This is a wonderful truth and we sometimes sing about it in our hymns. For instance, Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are, my glorious dress. And the term we use for this is taken from the law courts, from the legal system, and it's called justification. It means that a believer, they're not only acquitted, forgiven for their past sins, but they are clothed in the perfect righteousness of Christ. So when Luther came to the book of James, he couldn't see anything in there about the justification that he was thinking of in Romans. In fact, James does use the word justification in verses 20 and 24, but he's not using it in the same way that Paul uses it in Romans. You know, those of us who live in Froome, we know there's a, a little street in the centre of the town called Cheat Street. It's got a little stream running through the middle of it, and I'm sure somebody afterwards can tell me what you call that stream. Um, but uh, if you were to stand at the top of Cheap Street, you would see it from one angle. And if you were, I haven't tried this, by the way, but you, you might try it sometime. And if you stood at the bottom of Cheap Street, you'll see it from a different angle. But you're looking at the same street. It's the same street, and it's still got the same uh, little stream running through the mid middle of it. But it's looking at it from a different perspective. And this is what James is doing. He's looking at justification from a different perspective. It complements the doctrine of justification by faith alone in Christ alone. So, but such a faith is never alone. It's accompanied by what James calls works, or if you prefer the NIV translation, Deeds, good deeds. And so we might we must look at that in a moment. But first, let's consider someone who claims to have faith. Sorry, we missed the bit there about Luther. A claim to faith. Now I had a friend, he is he's now in heaven, um, but sometimes he would come to me and he would discuss to me used to discuss with me certain issues, questions he wanted to consider, and he called me his cardboard cutout. You may not think it's very flattering to be called a, a cardboard cutout, but it worked like this, that I was never really able to answer his questions, but, but as he asked the questions to me, it, all, it helped him to come to the answers that he needed. And here James, it's, it's as if he sets up his own cardboard cutout, uh, though they represent real people, I'm sure, the people he knew, but he, he, just, he just discusses questions with them. He asks questions with them. It's there in verse 14, where he, where he says, if someone says he has faith, or as the NIV has it, if someone claims to have faith, they've made a statement that they believe certain things about God. Um, and so James goes on to argue, if you just just say you have faith, that you believe certain things about God, about, about the Christ. Is that enough to save you? Of course, a person must come to believe certain things about the Lord Jesus. That he's the Son of God. That he came into this world to save sinners. But James is asking, in effect, has it made any difference in your life? And then he gives an example there in verses 15 to 17. Here is a brother or sister, and James is a very warm person to the people he's writing to. He loves to call people brothers and sisters. And this brother or sister, they're destitute. They hardly have any clothes on their backs. 
and hardly enough food to eat. And I'm sure that he knew Christians like that there in, in Judea and, and beyond the people he was writing to. And this person has made a bold claim, who, who has made a bold claim to faith, they say, depart in peace, be warmed and filled. But he doesn't give them what they need for their bodies. And I think we must assume that he has the means to give that person food and clothing. So then James asks, what does it profit, this faith, thus also faith by itself? And if I might, I might paraphrase it like this. A mere claim to faith by itself, but does not have works, is dead. And then James introduces someone else who says, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Again, this is a snatch of a conversation between James and his cardboard cutout. He just wants to underline the point. He just wants to... Just to say you have faith, but without anything to show for it, is a hollow claim. It's like we say in the marriage service, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Faith and works should go together. Then to reinforce his point, he introduces demons. He's still dealing with those who make a claim to have faith. You believe there is one God. And that was a, a basic uh, tenant of faith of, of Jews, uh, the, the Shema as it's called, there is one God. Well that's a good thing. Many people today don't believe there is a God, or they say they don't. Or they might believe in many gods as in some countries of the world, like in, in some of the religions of the world, Buddhism, Hinduism. So yes, you do well to believe that there is one God, but you really haven't got any further than demons have. They aren't atheists. They believe in one God and they tremble because one day the devil's troops are going to face God's final judgment. The demons that possessed the man called Legion in Luke chapter 8, they begged Jesus. They, they knew that they had to ask permission from him. He had such authority over them that he would not command them to go into the abyss. It was obviously a more fearful judgment for them than to go into the herd of swine which they asked permission to go into. But back to James. He is not saying that the presence of deeds, the presence of good works in a person's life proves a person has faith. There are probably many people involved in humanitarian work, or let's say Oxfam or something like that, who don't probably have a true living real faith and I think James is saying the absence of deeds may show the absence of faith so James says to our cardboard cutout, cut out but do you want to know and the word want is a strong word it carries with it a determined purpose you know some people can just raise questions <coughs> because they don't want to part with their sinful lives so they will raise all sorts of questions. John Blanchard says that there's a challenge here for, a, for the Christian. Are you honestly willing to know the word of God? To understand all its implications in your life? And to obey whatever God says to you through it? Well James then gives us a couple of examples of what it means to have an authentic faith. So thirdly, an authentic faith is never alone. The two examples he gives are in verses 21 and 25. Firstly, there's Abraham, and that would appeal to his Jewish re Jewish readers, the uh, the father of the, of, of the faith, the founder of the faith there in Genesis. And then a non-Jew, a Gentile, Rahab, the prostitute or the harlot, who became a believer. Let's just look at Abraham first. In verse 21 it says he was justified by works and in verse 22 faith was working together with his works. So where it says that Abraham and where it says that Abraham's faith faith was made perfect does not mean that his faith was defective rather it's saying that Abraham's faith 
was brought out into the open and it was proved to be real by this staggering act of obedience. I mean, I've tried to show that James uses justified in a different way from how Paul used it. So if I put it like this, faith is authenticated. It's shown to be real by works or to use the NIV's words, by, its, by deeds. That might be more understandable. Now we might ask, what does James mean by works or by deeds? People usually think of deeds or as good deeds, being kind to someone, coming alongside someone and helping them, encouraging them, visiting people in prison as Jim does, or using whatever gifts God's given you to help others. And I don't disagree with that. I think that is part and parcel of good works, of good deeds. But in Ephesians, uh, in Ephesians, after that well-known verse, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Even the very faith is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Then Paul goes on to say in the next verse, to, to, the, that, to that person who has been saved, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. But the works that James refers to, the deeds that James refers to in verse 31, they might, might seem rather unusual, rather out of the ordinary from what we would normally think of as good works. Because he refers there to when, when Abraham offered Isaac, his son, on the altar. That's referring to Genesis chapter 22, where God tested Abraham to go and offer his son Isaac. The one whom God had said was, would be the one who would inherit the promises. All God's promises to Abraham were, were in that son who he, who he was told to go and offer as a sacrifice. What lay behind this? Well, I think we can see a man who believed God. If you compare, compare Hebrews 11, verse 19, Abraham believed that God could raise Isaac, Isaac up, even if he was slain. And in a sense, by the, by the way, it is an, an acted picture of what God was going to do many centuries later when he sent his son, who willingly offered himself up for us. But this act of, uh, of offering up his son Isaac, it was a culmination of Abraham believing God over many years. Remember he had a midlife crisis when he was about 70, 75. He was called out of the idolatrous city of Ur of the Chaldees, very sophisticated city, called to go and live in tents. And he, and he went out and God gave him that wonderful promise that, that in him uh, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed, Genesis 12. And then in verse 23 of James 2, uh, James refers to an earlier occasion in Abraham's life. Genesis 15, verse 6, where it emphasises Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham's test to offer up his son, it was a one-off and God will not ask us literally to sacrifice, to offer children as a sacrifice. But he might call us metaphorically to offer up, to give up something that is dear to us. Now A.W. Tozer had six, six boys and one daughter called Rebecca. And it's very clear from, you read his biographies, that Rebecca was his favourite. Not sure if he should have had a favourite, but there you are. And there came a day when he realised that he must hand her over to God. But, it, but coming with that real, realisation, he said that to give her over to God was far safer than clinging on to her. So he said with tears, you can have her, God, the dearest thing I have. And he knew that handing her over to God was far safer than if he had tried to keep possession of her. William Cowper wrote in over a closer walk with God, the dearest idol I have known, whatever that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. 
And then James refers to another aspect of Abraham's faith. He was called the friend of God. It's called the friend of God three times in the Bible. And a real living faith is not just mental, a mental assent to a set of doctrines. It's a relationship with the living God. You heard about that this morning, I think. So we see these aspects of faith in Abraham. Then Rahab, the second example. James, what James, James could have chosen, someone like David or Samuel or, or Hannah. But no, he chooses a non-Israelite and whose profession would cause a few whispered comments. Rahab, a prostitute. That's what she was when she received the spies that Joshua sent to spy out the land of Canaan in Joshua 2. But that was to be her past. She now had a future, a future with God's people, because she believed God. Like Abraham, Rahab believed God's word. She was willing to risk her life for these spies because she believed God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And she had heard about this God of the Israelites, how he had opened the Red Sea for the Israelites, how he had defeated the two kings of the Amorites and how afraid her people were. And she makes this statement for the Lord your God. He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. And so we see God's grace working in this woman. She eventually married an Israelite man and was in the long list of descendants that led to the birth of Christ. You see Matthew chapter 1 verse 5. So we see faith working together with their deeds in these two people. And the common thing between them is that they both believed God. And that belief was shown in their actions. And as James concludes, For as a body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Someone said that when you row a rowing boat, you've got two oars. If you just had one oar, you would go round in circles. If you just had a belief in certain doctrines, that's one oar. But you need the other oar other as well, the actions for the boat to go forward. So just to conclude, when a person comes to a true saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then sooner or later it will be shown in their, their lives. I don't expect many of us read the uh, 39 articles of the Church of England. They're not actually bedtime reading, but they are good sound stuff. Uh, on the screen there, there should be Article 11, which is about justification. We are accounted righteous before God, only for the merit of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, by faith. We, we began by referring to Jimmy Carter. Um, for what... What little I do know of that man's life after he left the presidency, I believe he really did have a true and a living faith. There was enough evidence to convict him. And James's challenge is this. Is there fruit in your life to show you, to show you you have a true saving faith and a living relationship with God? As the Lord Jesus said, by their fruits you will know them. Let's turn now to our last hymn, O Thou Who Camest From Above, number 827, and we'll stand to sing.
the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen.